Um, we are going to be here tonight and tomorrow night as well. We thought it was important that we spend a couple of uh, gatherings together preparing ourselves for what maybe the Lord has set before us. Tomorrow night, I just want to remind you, we, we serve dinner once a month before church. It happens to be tomorrow night, so if you come early, we'll feed you. And then you can come and get fed again, both physically and spiritually. So we're looking forward to having you out for that. Also, uh, if you'd like to, when we are finished, be involved with Jay's ministry. Just kind of know what's going on, what they're doing. There is a sign-up table in, up at the, in the foyer. You can just put your email address on there. They'll make sure to add you to the list. I, I guarantee you they're not going to mark it yet. They just want to, you to pray with them and, and see what the Lord is doing. Peter wrote many years ago that we should always be ready to give an answer to every man for the hope that lies within us, what we should do so with meekness and with fear. And unless you've been living under a rock, you know, the Muslims have uh, been in the news lately, and man, do they need Jesus. And sometimes we are not in a position, or we may think we are not, to be able to engage them and share our faith with them in a meaningful way where we feel like maybe we have the confidence that we need and the tools that we need to do so. Last year I, I spoke with Jack Hibbs and, and Jay's been a part of their missions program for quite some time and they support him and his ministry and so he had told me in New Jersey about Jay's ministry and said man I'm going to see if we can have him come out and fortunately we were able to catch him this time out and, and grab him for a couple of days to spend with us. Um, Jay's uh, background is he was born in India to missionary parents. He has been involved in missions for the last 30 plus years anyway to the to the Muslims. He, he lives uh, most of the year in London. He will tell you, I'm sure, a lot about his background and all, but, but for us, I'm just appreciative of the fact that, that God raises up in the body those that we need, and I think we need him and his ministry to help us. So he's going to be here for two nights. Now tonight, just so you're ready, is historical. It's background information. It's, it's not as much fun as tomorrow night will be. But if you don't have the background, you're not going to be able to get out there and do what you needed to do. So we want you to have a, a good, adequate, uh, substantive background in your outlook to, to radical Islam. Where does it come from? Where is it headed? Who's really the face of that? What, what can we expect to find as far as numbers and people and things that you may not have known? And then tomorrow, uh, Jay's going to come and he's going to give to us some, some tools that we can have, that we can utilize in our own personal evangelism ministries and outreach. And I know that God's going to use you. So I hope you'll be here today and tomorrow. Prepare yourself. Um, if, you, if you like what you hear, I know that I've been able to watch a lot of Jay's ministry stuff on, on YouTube. You just Google his name, you'll find him. And there's some dynamic things that, that will help you to be a better witness to those whom God is seeking to reach. Jesus died for the Muslim world, you know that. And his blood shed for their sins. So we, don't, don't give up. Prayerfully, we've got to go out in these last days and reach those that are unwilling to hear and maybe you're just not, no one's willing to talk to them about it. So I, I know that you're going to be blessed over the next couple of days and I'm looking forward to hear what, what Jay's going to share with us. So would you welcome my brother, Jay Smith. Jack, thanks. thanks. Okay. If we could put, is there any way I can get these lights off so that could be seen all right? You don't need to see me so much. Um, just to give some background as to why I am speaking about this subject particularly, for the last 20 years, 22 years, I've been living in London and uh, working with radical Muslims. There are very few of us in the world who actually work with radical Muslims. I was called in 1992 to do just that uh, because my area of expertise is apologetics and polemics. I am a polemicist, which I can see from all the blank faces, no one knows what I'm talking about. Now you have a football team here, don't you, Jack? What's your football team? I'm sorry, isn't there one in this, in this valley? There's no one you support? No football team for Los Angeles. Chargers, San Diego. All right. I'm a Philadelphia Eagle man, so I'm in the wrong place. But on your, the Chargers team, you have two different teams, don't you? You have your defense and you have your offense, right? And your defense has a certain uh, a criteria. They have a certain skills that are different than the offense, right? Am I correct on that? Two completely different teams with different skills. They don't even, they're not even on the field at the same time. And the de defense makes sure that the others don't score against you. Now, in Christianity, we have a great defense. In fact, you just gave the scripture on it, 1 Peter 3.15, which says, be ready to defend with peace and with gentleness. 
We call that apologetics. Apologetics is defending the faith. And we have apologetics all over the world. I don't know, most seminaries and most Bible schools have classes on apologetics. We do a very good job on how to defend the existence of God, how to defend the whole problem of suffering. What do you do with the authority of scripture? These kind of things. And most of you have been taught in apologetics. But as you well know, if you uh, support the San Diego Chargers, Chargers, you don't win the game just with defense. You also need offense. You need people to score against the other team. In fact, they're probably the more popular players, are they not? They're certainly the higher paid. And they have a whole different set of skills than the defense has. And that's called offense. Now, we don't have any offense in Christianity. There's no school in the world that teaches offense. And the name we give for offense is polemics. Polemics is going the other direction. Apologetics is defending against the other att that attacks against us. Polemics is going on the offense and confronting the other. Is there any school anywhere in the world, any seminary, or any Bible school that teaches polemics? I'm a polemicist. There's very few of us. I'm not asking you to do polemics, okay? Let me say that very quickly. You're not to do polemics. Let me do the polemics, all right? There's very few of us that do polemics with Muslims. David Wood in New York, he does polemics. Sam Shamoon in Chicago, he does polemics against Muslims. Nabil Quraysh, a convert from Islam, he's an amazing polemicist. He's coming to Oxford. He'll be joining our team next year. Then you also have Dr. James Wood in Phoenix, a great polemicist. But that's about it. Those are the main polemicists that I know in your country. I'm the only one doing it in Europe. There's a few in Australia, two in South Africa, three now we're raising up in India. There's very few of us that know how to attack Islam. And that's not an easy thing to do. Attacking Islam, if you're going to attack Islam, you better know your material. And first and foremost, you better know who your enemy is. And you better know their material better than they know it. And that's why to do polemics, you're going to have to use a whole new set of tools. Now what I'm going to show you today, and what I'm going to show you tonight, is why your country is having a real problem with this group that's up on the screen, ISIS. Your president sometimes call them ISIL. He shouldn't use those terms. ISIL is the wrong name. What does it mean? Islamic State of Iraq and Al-Shams. That's what ISIS means. Iraq is a country, Al-Shams would be Syria. Your president wants to use ISIL, which is Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant. Now the Levant also includes Lebanon and Israel. Does your, your president really believe that this group is in charge of Lebanon and Israel already? He's already giving them ground by using that term. He shouldn't use that. ISIS is bad enough. But what I want to do tonight is to help you to understand who this group is. You need to know what their background is. You need to know where they came from, why they're so popular. Why is it this group that moved into Iraq just six weeks ago with 800 men have grown to 10,000? From 800 to 10,000 in just six weeks. Where are they getting these numbers from? Your media is not helping you out. Your government is stupefied by this group. So is my government in Britain. And that's why I'm here, to help you to understand what's going on. Now, they call them radical Muslims. Is that the name they give them? What do they give them? I've heard radical all the time. These are radical Muslims. That's actually the right word. I don't think your government realize how correct they are. Because what does the word radical mean in English? Radical number is what? A root number. So radical means root, right? A radical Muslim is someone who goes back to the root. And if you're going to go back to the root, you've got to, you've got to go back to two authorities. You've got to go back to this book here, the Quran. Now, Pastor, I didn't ask permission to bring this in the church. I hope it's okay with you. It's very small. It's not going to hurt anybody. Believe me. I've destroyed this book many times, and I'll destroy it many times, even tomorrow especially. But certainly, this is the book. This is their authority. This is, they believe, divine edict. This is a eternal book that has never been created. This book cannot be critiqued. It is perfect. It has never been changed, never been corrupted, much like our Bible, they say. Now, this is their root. To, know, to be a radical Muslim, you've got to know this book. How many in this audience have read this book? You read it all the way through, Jack. There's a man that I like. It's rare to meet a pastor that's read the Quran. God bless you. Well, you're on my team. But see, we're not teaching people to read this book. And until you read this book, you won't understand what this group is doing. Because this group is going back to this book. They're reading it. 
They're exegeting it. They're applying it. And they're actually living it out. So a radical Muslim believes in going back to the root. Now, there are many people that believe that radical Muslims have only been around since the time of the inception of Israel in 1948. And because of Iraq and Afghanistan, the wars that are happening, that have just happened, that is what has, called, that is what has caused radical Islam. Do you believe that? Do you think radical Islam is nothing more than a reaction against the West? Good for you. You've trained them well, Jack. And that's why we need to be careful how we define terms. Because most people I meet, when they hear about radical Muslims, they say radical Muslims are nothing more than a political problem, which needs a political solution. This is something the government is responsible for, and we have no responsibility whatsoever. It's not our problem. I'm hearing that all the time. I'm hearing it in churches. I hear it with missionaries. I hear it with lots of very fearful Christians in Europe who don't want to be held responsible and certainly don't want to have to deal with radical Islam. Now, Radical Islam is not new. It's been around since the very beginning. And the reason you, for that is you just need to go back and see where it began. You need to go back to the Prophet's life himself, the Prophet's biography. How many here have read the Prophet's biography? Written by Ibn Ishaq. You've read it. Written by Ibn Hisham and al waqidi You've read those. I'm sure you have. You're, I just met him today. We actually know each other, so I know you've read it. Now, when you read his biography, is it pleasant reading? Not at all especially from 624 to 632, the last eight years of his life. Those last eight years are not pleasant reading. But how many of your government officials have read the prophet's example, have read his biography? Very few of them. And if they have, they're certainly not, are not saying anything about it because they don't want the world to know what the prophet actually did. When I say the prophet, I mean Muhammad. Okay, Muhammad the prophet. But in order to really understand radical Islam, you need to go back to another man. 1300s, there is a man named Ibn Taymiyyah. Ibn Taymiyyah is the man that said, in order to be a true Muslim, you must follow the example of the Prophet, and you must follow his revelation. The man in the book. You follow the man, you follow the book. Now, 200 years later, a man in Germany said much the same thing. Martin Luther, did he not? When he hammered that 95 thesis up on Wittenberg door, and he protested against the church. That's why we're now called Protestants. We're protesters. He was protesting, but what did he say? In order to be a true Christian, you don't follow all these, uh, these traditions that have been in inculcated into the church. You must go back to Scripture. Sola Scriptura is what he said. And we call that the Great Reformation. Without realizing, Islam had their Reformation 200 years before us, saying much the same thing. Martin Luther said, you must go back to scripture modeled by Jesus Christ. Ibn Taymiyyah said, you must go back to the Quran modeled by Muhammad. Are you following that? In 1700, 400 years later, there were two men that were studying there in Medina. One was named Al-Wahhab and the other was named Al-Wahihula. These two men were studying at the same time. They were studying Ibn Taymiyyah's material. Al-Wahhab stayed in Arabia. He was from Arabia himself. Wahihula was from India. He went back to Patna in India. And Wahhab started Wahhabism, which became amalgamated with the Ibn Saud family. They used it to give themselves authority, and they then conquered all the surrounding tribes and created what we now know today as Saudi Arabia. And their theology and their dictum was created by Wahhabism from the man's name, Wahhab, who used his material from Ibn Taymiyyah. What did Ibn Taymiyyah say? You follow Muhammad and you follow his revelation. And that's exactly what Wahhabism is about. To reduce it down to two simple terms, Wahhabism is basically follow the man, follow the book. Simple as that. Wahihula did the same thing in India, and starting in Patna. When the British came, they created a huge fury against these radical Muslims, and they drove them right across into the western part of India, into what is today Pakistan, up into Waziristan, the northern frontier. Now let's jump into the 20th century. In the 20th century, then, you have two groups growing simultaneously, both in Egypt and in India. In Egypt, in the 1920s, you have a man named Hassan al-Banna. Hassan al-Banna starred the Muslim Brotherhood, using Wahhab's material, again, what did Wahhab say? He said the same Ibn Taymiyyah said. You follow the book and you follow the man, Muhammad and his Quran. He was teaching that and he started the Muslim Brotherhood, which started from that premise to know how to walk, talk, eat, drink, and sleep. You know how to, you have to follow everything 24 7. Whatever Muhammad did, you do. If he wore short trousers, you wear short trousers. If he had a beard that's the length of one hand, you wear a beard the length of one hand. If he beat his wife, you beat his wife, your wife. And so that's why a Muslim brother. 
his wife, his wife. I got it. I won't beat my wife, so this is something new to me. <laughs> Nonetheless, it's right there in Surah 4, Ayah 34, in the Quran itself. It says, if a woman stands against you, beat her. You first admonish her, and you throw her from the bed. If that doesn't work, then you beat her. It's right there in the Quran. So you can see, they're going back to the book to follow how they're supposed to deal with their own wives. So here you have the Muslim Brotherhood. One of his greatest students was a man named Said Qutb. Now let's go, let's go and look at these fellows so you can see what we're talking about. Let's start with the Indian subcontinent. That's where my, I put the slide to slow together just this afternoon, so forgive me if I'm not keeping up with my slides. Before we get to the Muslim Brotherhood, let's go over to Indian, subco Indian subcontinent. Because at the same time that Hassan Labana was starting the Muslim Brotherhood, another man over there in India in the 1920s named Muhammad Ilyas was starting another group called the Tabikli Jamaat. Tabligh Jamaat started in 1926. Muhammad Ilyas basically said, in order to understand what a true Muslim is, you need to go to the Quran. But in order to understand the Quran, to know how to exegete it, to apply it, you need to follow what the Prophet said, what the Prophet did. And how the Prophet lived is how the Quran is to be revealed. Again, the book and the man, the same paradigm. It's as simple as that. Now, the Tabligh Jamaat has grown and grown and grown. In the 1940s, another man from India named Maududi, Abu Allah Maududi, who actually grew up in Deoban, not too far from where I grew up. I used to go right through Deoban on my way to see my parents every time we took a vacation. And we would stop there on our trains, and there would be these madrasas on every side of the railway tracks. So I've known all about the Deobandis, and I've known all about Maududi. In 1947, he was at partition. He moved over into Pakistan and started a group called the jamaat e islami which has grown and grown and influenced these men who and these schools that had started to grow up in the Waziristan, in the northern frontier. Now, these schools, these madrasas, they call them, have now been spewing out hundreds and thousands of talibes. Talibes means students. These talibes today are graduating 1.7 million graduates every year from these madrasas. 1.7 million talibes are being graduated from these madrasas in the northern frontiers. All using the dictum of following the book and the man. The Talibans became the Taliban. The Taliban then moved into Afghanistan. They threw out the Russians. Remember that? You probably don't remember that because that wasn't really on your page at that time. None of you were paying attention because it wasn't, part, wasn't really had any impact on the United States. Now let's jump back over to the other side of the world, back to Egypt again. Remember I talked about Hassan al-Banya. Hassan al-Banya had, oh, and I'm missing a slide here. That's okay. Hassan al-Banya had a student named Said Qutb. Said Qutb was his brightest student. He had memorized the Quran, which is about the size of our New Testament, that by the time he was 10 years old. So this was no little floozy. He was seen and understood, and he was such a, 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 a prodigy that Gemal al-Nasr took him and sent him to America in the 1940s to do his master's degree here in Colorado. And while he was here in 1948, two Two, uh, three things happened that changed his mind. He went to a church thinking that Christianity would be something that he could amalgamate with, and when he was at the church, they were going to have a barn dance that night. And so he went with them to the barn dance, and as they were dancing, he noticed that men and women were dosing, doing each other, but they weren't married together. And here they were holding hands, and they were unmarried. And he said, well, this is immorality. Why is it no one had told me this? He said, I can't have anything to do with Christianity if you have this kind of immorality. And so he turned his back on Christianity as being a religion that he could have something to do with. At the same time, he heard that his good tutor, his good friend, Hassan al-Banya, had, had been killed by Gemal al-Nasr. Gemal al I'm sorry, Gemal Nasr. And simultaneously, at the same time, the state of Israel was created, all in 1948. He came back to Egypt, disillusioned with Christianity, disillusioned with Pan-Arabism, the secular form of Islam that Gemal Nasr was trying to introduce, and disillusioned with the West for having created this aberration, as he called it, called Israel. Became the theologian for the Muslim Brotherhood, was then jailed in 1956 by Gamal Nasser, and for 10 years in prison, he then wrote a, a exegete, or you may say a commentary on the Quran called In the Shade of the Quran. Now that commentary takes each verse of the Quran and applies it to in the 20th century. You can find it in English, you can get it up online, read it, because if you're gonna understand radical Islam, you're gonna have to read that book. Because that book is the textbook for all radical Muslims today. All my radical Muslim friends quote from that book. And that book does nothing more than just explain the Quran for today. 
Now, he was executed in 1966 in prison, became a martyr. That's, and his best student was this man that you see over here on the left. That's Ayman Zawahiri. Ayman Zawahiri had memorized the Quran by the time he was 15. He then was also in Egypt, was imprisoned, and he was let go by Gamal Nasser. He then wanted to, wanted to uh, amalgamate with somebody and found a man named Osama bin Laden, who was a very rich playboy, part of the bin Laden family. This is the family that builds many of the tall buildings in the Middle East. They are builders. He was a multimillionaire because of that. He didn't know much theology. But when he met Ayman Zawahiri, who did know theology, they formed together Al-Qaeda. They tried to work in Sudan. That didn't work. And then they were invited to go to, to Afghanistan by the Taliban. They set up shop in Afghanistan. And then in 9-11, you know the story, 2001. We're going to celebrate it in just two days. Not celebrate it. Memori memori remember it. They then sent those 19 young men to do what they did here in the United States. And that's where you came into the picture. And that's where I think you all woke up, that there was a radical group of Islam. Now, since then, we as Americans, we then went and destroyed, we thought, the Taliban. Did we destroy the Taliban? We just sent them back home, back to Pakistan, where they came from to begin with. 1.7 million of their Taliban being graduated every year. We also thought that we had eradicated the Taliban because we have used bombs, bullets, and cruise missiles. Can you eradicate radical Islam with bombs, bullets, and cruise missiles? We'll get back to that question. There you can see Ayman Zawahiri on the left. That's Osama bin Laden on the right. Now, one of Ayman Zawahiri's favorite students was a man named Yusuf Qaradawi. You probably don't know that name, but if you're a Muslim anywhere in the, in the Muslim world, that name is well known. He's probably considered to be the most popular cleric today because he's on Al Jazeera television every night. He lives in Qatar, and Al Jazeera, where Al Jazeera is headquartered. And he exegetes the Bible for Muslims all over the world. He is known as a moderate Muslim. So in 2004, uh, Ken Livingston, my mayor of London, invited him to come to London to talk about and explain moderate Islam, knowing that he was the most popular cleric in the world. He arrived at Heathrow Airport July 7th. That's his, that means nothing to you, but if you were British, you would know that date very well. July 7th, 2004, he arrived in Heathrow Airport. And the first question that was asked him there in the news media was, what about suicide bombers? And he said, fine, there's no problem with suicide bombers. It's perfectly legitimate with this Islam, providing that the people that you're destroying are Israelis, men, women, or children, and American soldiers. And then without even being asked, he then went on to say, and it's perfectly okay for men to beat their wives, and we must also lash the, homo the homosexuals a hundred lashes. Now, suddenly... Ken Livingston became quite red, embarrassed, because this is the man he thought was going to be a moderate Muslim to show moderate Islam, and he was anything but moderate. They should have looked at his credentials. They should have looked and seen who was his teacher. His teacher was Ayman Zawahiri. Yusuf Qaradawi is part of the Muslim Brotherhood, has always been part of the Muslim Brotherhood. Why didn't Ken Livingston know that? Because no one's looking and seeing where they come from or what they're saying. Now. That's what's happening in Egypt. Let me, before I get to that picture, let me just back up and ask you, how many people know of these names like Tabikli Jamaat or Jamaat-e-Islami? Have you even heard them before tonight? The Tabikli Jamaat, started in 1926 by Muhammad Ilyas, has grown and grown and grown. Probably the most radical group in the world today. It now has a membership of 80 million. Eight zero million. That's larger than the entire population of Britain right there. It's in 120 countries. Most of the young men that I have to deal with every Sunday, and I go down to Speaker's Corner every Sunday, down in Hyde Park, it's the bastion of freedom of speech. We can go down there, it is free. I've been doing it for 22 years. I get up on a ladder, a little kitchen ladder, just puts my head above the carpet, get above the crowd, and we take on hundreds of Muslims every Sunday. Almost all of them are part of the Tabigli Jamaat or the jamaat -e islami They're the most radical Muslims I can find, and they are the most exciting men and women to work with. Because I know exactly what they're going to say. I know exactly where we're going to go to. They all go back to the book and the man. They all go back to Ibn Taymiyyah. They all go back to Wahihula and Wahab. They all go back to Maududi. And they all go back to Muhammad Ilya. So these are the common names. These are the names they admire, they look up to. But we're not teaching this in our seminaries. We're not teaching this anywhere in our Bible schools. You've never even heard this material before. This is all new to you. 
I have to deal with this day in and day out. And that's why we need to wake up. Something's happening that we're not paying attention to. These two men on the left over here used to come down. The one on the uh, this man right here, Asaf Hanif, the one with the beard, used to come down to Speaker's Corner every Sunday. He would be in the crowd there while I was up on the ladder. I didn't get to know him personally. I knew of him. Uh, he knew me very well. He was always sitting there yelling at me. But he got, he got to know one of my friends on our team. He went to his home. Ben was his name. Ben also went to Asaf Hanif's home. And then in October of 2002, he suddenly disappeared. When we asked what had happened to him, we were told that he had gone to Syria to learn Arabic. Good place to learn Arabic. Then on April 30th, 2003, his picture, in fact, both those pictures, were on the cover of every newspaper in London and in Britain. The night before, in Tel Aviv, in a discotheque called Mike's Bar, there about 200 people were dancing inside, and these two men tried to get into the bar. They were stopped at the bar by the bouncers. Asaf Ani pulled the pin on his jacket, blew himself up, and killed three Israelis right there at the door. Omar Sharif, the fellow on the left, not the back there, there's another Omar Sharif, he pulled the pin on his jacket, it was a dud, it didn't go off, so he jumped into the ocean and drowned. And their picture was on the, on, the, on the front of every newspaper. Now that Sunday, I wanted to find out what was going on. And I remember asking people, this is our Asaf Hanif, this is the man that we knew, this is the man that used to be in our crowd. What was he doing over there in Israel, blowing himself up? And I remember two years later then, I remember, I'm sorry, that very Sunday, I went down to Speaker's Corner. I wanted to find out what people were talking about. No one was talking about what was, had been in the news that whole day. So I got up on my ladder, and I held their pictures up, those two same pictures. I held them up, and I said, I want to talk about these two men. Who wants to talk about these two men? And suddenly, I sucked all the crowds from the other ladders. They all came to my crowd. And I said, I want all the Muslims front and center. I want to talk to you Muslims. And I turned to the Muslims that were there, and I said, take a look at these two men right here. How many of you support what these two men did? And about 30 raised their hands. Then I said to those who raised their hand, I want, how many of you will do what these two men have done? How many will actually blow yourselves up for your God right now here at Speaker's Corner? And about 15 started punching the air, yelling, Allahu Akbar, Alhamdulillah, Bismillah, Takbir. And I turned to the crowd, which had tripled by that time. And there was horror on the faces of the people as they watched this. And I turned to the crowd and I said, look at their faces. Memorize these faces. This is not a faceless enemy off there in Iraq or Afghanistan. This is right here in London. These men are willing to blow themselves up for their God. What are you going to do about it? That was in 2003, 2005, July 7th. Remember, exactly a year to the date after Yusuf Karadawi had come and said it's perfectly okay to commit suicide for your God. July 7th, four young men came down, got on three trains and one bus, blew themselves up and killed 52 people in London. Did you all hear about it? Did you hear what happened two weeks later? Four, five other young men tried to do the exact same thing. Had backpacks on their back. They pulled the detonators. The detonators went off. Fortunately, the chemicals in the bombs had deteriorated over the intervening two weeks, and they didn't explode. Not one of them killed anybody. They just ruined their shirts. They're now in Belmarsh prison. We've had a real problem in London with bombers. We've had the, the backpack bombers that were successful. We had the second group that were not successful. We've had the Blue Water bombers. These are the bombers that tried to blow up Blue Water, which is our big, one of our big malls, with fertilizer. They were caught before they could do that. We had the shoe bomber who tried to blow up Air France jet, and he was from uh, South London. Maybe you heard about the medical bombers, the, two, the four young men who tried to blow up two pubs in London, and then finally they were foiled, so they went up, flew up to Glasgow and tried to blow up Glasgow Airport, and that, one of their bombs went off, and he was killed by the fire from that bomb. You've heard about that? Have you heard about the liquid bombers? The bombers who try to go into Heathrow Airport, and they try to go into planes to blow up those planes. That's why you can't take liquids on board planes. It's called, it happened there in London. We have now 149 young men now in prison in London, at Belmarsh Prison. Every one of them have either been caught making bombs, transporting bombs, or exploding bombs. Every one of them are Muslim. All of them, except for four, are British citizens. Can you see the problem we have? These are homegrown people. These are not people from overseas who are coming to blow us up. These are people who have been bred, grown up. Asaf Hanif. He went to Kingston University. He was not disillusioned. He was not disenfranchised. Every one of these bombers come from middle class to upper class families. They're all educated. 
None of them are poor. Their parents don't even know what they're doing. We now have 450 young men and women who have left Britain in the last six weeks to join ISIS. Every one of them have parents who don't know what they're doing. They're as surprised as you are, but I'm not surprised because I have to work with these guys day in and day out. Now, what is their agenda? They say the West is in decline, and you hear this all the time. Culturally, loss of national identity. Socially, breakdown of the family. They use statistic after statistic. You can open up any newspaper in Britain. You can see an enormous amount of statistics that show that the family is in decline. Morally, the immorality in our movies and our television, they have no problem finding statistics to back them up. Spiritually, in Europe now, only 5% of the population goes to church. In Britain, it's a little better. It's 7%. That means 95% don't go to church at all anymore. We are probably the most depleted religious society on earth. Economically, it's in decline because we use usury. We use capitalistic context, which is completely anathema for Islam. And politically, because we have a democratic state. The whole idea of democracy is anathema for Islam. Islam will only use a theocratic model. Therefore, they say, since they have declined in all the, every area of life, the only answer is Islam. But not just any Islam, the true Islam, the radical Islam, the rooted Islam, the Islam that goes back to the book and the man. It's Islam that must eradicate this morality using Sharia law. It's Islam that must eradicate usury interest by using Islamic banking. It's Islam that must eradicate democracy by creating a theocratic state using the caliphate. And it's Islam that wants to eradicate Western militaries using the ummah, the believers. This is their solution. There are three steps to what they call dahwah, which is evangelism. And the three steps follow the three stages of the Prophet's own life. When he was in Mecca, up until 622, he was a minority at that time, and so therefore he could not use any weapons, he could not use any violence, he could not use any power, he had no authority himself, and therefore he just used his word and the revelations he received. And that's why when you look at the Meccan surahs, if you take the Quran and just split it in half, this is the first half, this is the second half, the second half are Meccan surahs. This is the earlier part of the revelation that was revealed between 610 and 622. This is the material that he used supposedly when he was in Mecca, and you won't find any violence there. It's, it's not peaceful, but it's not violent. It's lots of theology, and it's much, much to do about who he was as a prophet and how that he must be revered and how he and Allah kind of stand together. It's this part of the Quran that becomes problematic. This is the part that was revealed between 622 and 632, the last 10 years of his life when he was in Medina, and that's where you find the violent. Verse after verse after verse. We'll talk more about that. So they say that when he moved to Medina, and let's, but, but, let's how you apply that today. So therefore today, Muslims that are here in the United States, they're still in that first stage, and that's the stage of what they call the pen, where they can, you can use tapes, videotapes, YouTube, meetings, to try to influence people. And that's why most Muslims around you are peace-loving, are they not? They're in that first stage of Dahwa, which models the first stage of Muhammad's life there in Mecca. When Muhammad moved to Medina in 622, then for two years he tried to make a relationship with the Jews that were there, and he created laws and rules and regulations, and he created the treaties. They have the, you have the Treaty of Medina that was created at that time. And that's the two-year period that they say that most Islam will then move into where it's trying to impose laws, rules, and regulations. And that we have already in the United Kingdom. We have lots of rules, regulations that are coming in for all kinds of laws. We now have laws. We even have now law courts. We have Sharia courts. We have 80 Sharia courts now in Britain that are legitimate Sharia courts. They are now under British law. Britain has now in, in, encouraged Sharia courts. They were introduced in 2009 because of the archbishop who said it's perfectly legitimate for Islam to have its own courts. Heinous to think of how much damage he has done. Now that's in Britain. So far you don't have that in America. Thank God. I don't think it'll ever come to this country. But then in 624, the Jews rejected him. They refused to accept him for a very good reason. For four reasons I don't have time to go into tonight. So when they rejected him, he rejected them, and that's when he started using the sword. 
And from 624 on, up until 632, the last eight years of his life, he was involved in 29 battle campaigns. The three great major Jewish uh, families were all eradicated. I'll talk about that a little bit later. And that's where the sword began. And that's what Muslims say. We will then eventually come to the sword. So we start with the pen. We go to the scale, which is laws, rules, and regulation that we bring into, impose, and to create our own hegemony and our own, yes, theology and our own territory. And then when that, the next stage then is the second Medinan stage, which is using the sword. That's what they want to move into in Europe. Those are the three stages of Daha. I'll just continue on to this. Where do they get their sources from? The Quran and the Prophet. Let's take a look at the Quran to begin with. When you look at the Quran, you always ask, where are these verses on Peace. And I've always been told, well, Surah 2, Ayah 256, there is no compulsion in religion. That's probably one of the most common verses that you'll get. Yet take a look at that verse and read the rest of the verse and ask yourself and ask any Muslim friend this, who is that verse for? There is no compulsion in religion. It's all about Muslims. It's for Muslims only. Why? Because it talks about if you accept Allah, you will be saved. If you reject Allah, great will be your future in hellfire. So there's all kinds of compulsion. But you look the rest of the verse. Read verse 257 and you'll see that this is for Muslims alone. That is not a verse to do with us. More than that, it's a Meccan verse. Now we have a, what they call, they have a, what they call a law of abrogation built into the Quran. Since there are so many violent verses in the Medinan surahs and so many supposedly meaningful, benign, peaceful verses in the Meccan surahs, what do you do with this seeming contradiction? Surah 2, Ayah 106 and Surah when I say surah, I mean book. So let me just get it. Book 2, verse uh, 106, and verse six, uh, chapter 16, verse 101 say, if you have two, two verses, you always, always, always go with the later verse. That's called the law of abrogation. You always go with the Medinan verse. It abrogates the Meccan verses. Are you following that? So, surah 2, I-256 is abrogated. In fact, there's 101 verses that come out after that abrogate surah 2, I-256. They try surah 2, 190, those who fight you do not transgress limits. So if you're being de fought against, don't defend, defend yourself, but don't go, upon, go be above the limits. What limits are they not to go beyond? Look at, look at the rest of the verse. And slay them wherever you catch them and fight them until they prevail faith in Allah. What's left once you've slain them? If you read the whole verse, does this sound very peaceful to you? So they like to go to Surah 5, Ayah 31 and 32. We ordain for the children of Israel that if anyone slew a person, not in the retaliation of murder, or to be spread mischief in the land, it would be as if he slew the whole people. And if anyone saved a life, it would be as if he saved the life of the whole people. That seems pretty peaceful, doesn't it? Pretty benign. The only problem, who's it for? Children of Israel. Are Muslims children of Israel? So you've got a problem right there. So I asked my radical friends, how do you do, do, use this verse? And they say, well, actually, you need to ask, who are these people? And when they tell me, they say, this is how you should interpret it. If you take the blood of one Muslim in Chechnya or Bosnia or Kashmir or Afghanistan or Iraq, you have taken the blood of all Muslims. But if you save the one life of one Muslim in Chechnya or Bosnia or Kashmir or Afghanistan or Iraq, you have saved the life of all Muslims. A young Muslim a year ago in June, Michael Aribalajo, got into a car with his friend Michael Aribalawi, both from Nigeria. They were converts to Islam. They had converted to Islam in 2003. This is 2013. They looked for a soldier. They found him in Woolwich barrack, Barracks, and they ran him down. He was still alive. They jumped out of the car. They slid off his throat, dragged him into the street, and then they stood around for 16 minutes until the police arrived. Did you all read about this? The Woolwich, bomb, the Woolwich uh, drum, drummer Rigby? They did not run away. They purposely stayed there. And they talked to the crowd, and they got filmed by the crowd. And this is one of the verses Michael Adbalajo used. If you take the blood of us, I'm sorry you had to see this, he says, but if you take the blood of our soldiers in Iraq and Afghanistan, then we have the right to, to save the blood of our soldiers in Iraq and Iraq, uh, Afghanistan. Our soldiers? Here is a man with a Romford accent there in London talking about our soldiers in Iraq and Afghanistan. He wasn't from Iraq or Afghanistan. He was quoting this verse. And then he said, if you take the blood, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, most people thought he was quoting the Bible. No, he was quoting the Quran. In Surah 5, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a nose for a nose, an ear for an ear. This comes straight out of the Quran. He gave a piece of paper to one of the ladies there on the side, and they read the paper there at the trial in January of this year, and it was verse after verse after verse from the Quran. 
This man was quoting straight out of the Quran. That's why he was doing. Why did he cut off the head? Because he was quoting Surah 47, Ayah 4. Cut off the heads of the unbelievers. And then verse 5 and 6 says, And he who participates in jihad, if he should die, great shall be his reward in heaven, for he shall be in paradise. That's why he was waiting the 16 minutes for the police to come. And as soon as the police came, he ran at the police, hoping to be shot so he could be a shaheed. He could be a suicide, a martyr. Because only that verse gives them assurance of salvation. That's the only assurance of salvation you will find in the Quran. There is no assurance of salvation in Islam. There's only a hope of salvation. Only if you die in the cause of Allah will you go straight to heaven. The police only shot him and wounded him. And that was his fury at the trial that he was not killed. That's taking that verse. Now let's go on. What kind of mischief in the land? Let's go on then to the sword verses. Now these are the verses that are replete all through the Medinans. But when the forbidden months are past, then fight and slay those who join other gods with Allah. Before, wherever ye find them, besiege them, seize them, lay in wait with them for every kind of ambush. What about us as Christians? Make war upon those to whom the scriptures have been given, the Ali Kitab. That's us. They're to make war upon us. That's in the exact same surah, verse 29. What about the methodology? Strike off their heads, surah 47, ayah 4 says, and fight them until there is no more unbelief. In other words, that they all become Muslims in surah 8, 38 and 39. And here's what happens if those who do get caught dying in jihad. There's only two verses, surah 4, ayah 74, and surah 47, ayah 46. Look at those verses. Those are all the sword verses. How many knew that there were this many violent verses in the Quran? 149 of them. Yet do you not hear all the time for your Muslim friends that Islam is a religion of peace? That the Quran is a book of peace? That Muhammad is a man of peace? Is that what you're hearing? I'm hearing it all the time. What Quran are they talking about? Tony Blair, our former prime minister, used to get up and he would say publicly, I have read the Quran three times through and all I see is peace and tolerance. I would love to know what Quran he's reading. But then he's a politician. He had to say that. And I don't ask him. I realize he, what he would be up against. If he ever did say as a politician, I've read the Quran and the violent verses really bother me. You can imagine what would happen the next day. Every Muslim would call for his resignation. Every Muslim country would pull back their ambassadors and, and demand a public apology. That's why politicians cannot, know, cannot say what they know. They dare not talk about the Quran. That's not their remit. They are not there to, to pronounce on religious theology. So, what about the Prophet himself? He is the model for these verses. How did he model these verses? Look at his biography, the Siratu Rasulullah. Look at his sayings, the Hadith. Look at the battles he was involved in. Between 624 and 632, he was involved in 29 battles. He planned another 39 on top of that. His whole life was full of violence after he moved to Medina. If you want to look at his example, look and see what he did to those under his jurisdiction. Look and see what he did to the Jews there in Medina. The three Jewish tribes that stood against him, they were not part of the Treaty of Medina. Their names are not on that treaty. There are other Jewish names, but not their names. Their names are missing from that treaty. They never signed any treaty with him because they refused to accept him as a prophet of God, as any good Jew should do and any good Christian should do as well. And that's why in 624, he threw out the first Jewish tribe after the Battle of Badr. The Banu Kainuka family. A year later, in 625, he came back and threw out the second Jewish tribe, the Banu, uh, uh, the Banu um, Ndia family, and that was after the Battle of Uhud. And then two years later, in 627, he took all the 800 men, 800 men from the Jewish tribe there, took them out to the desert, had them dig, dig trenches, and then he slit every one of their throats. 800 men in one afternoon. So by five years, within five years of moving to Medina, remember, he's not from Medina himself. All the Jews were eradicated. Now, we have a name for that today. We call that genocide. How many people are willing to say that Muhammad committed genocide? I say it all the time. And I make no apologies for it. And I'm quoting his own biography. I just tell Muslims, if you don't like what I say, you come up with a better word. That's exactly what Muhammad did. But you're not teaching that here in the United States. It's not in your news. It's in none of your books. No one's permitted to say that publicly. Can you imagine if Muslims really knew who their prophet was and what he did? Now, those who criticized them were all assassinated. We know of 25 people that were killed, and their only crime was criticizing Asma, the poetess. When he first moved to Medina, she wrote poetic verse again. He said, who's going to take care of this woman for me? One of his disciples went to her house that evening. She was suckling her baby. He stabbed her through the heart, went the next morning, told Muhammad what he had done. And Muhammad said, great are you, Umar, for what you have done for your prophet. 
this a man of peace? Her only crime was criticism. Can you now understand why when those 12 cartoons in Holland went public, there was thousands of Muslims all over the world that rioted against those 12 cartoons, and 17 people lost their lives because of those cartoons. Where is their example? Muhammad is their example. The book and the man, the book and the man, always coming back to that paradigm. With these scriptures and the example of the Prophet Muhammad, can you then understand why so many within Islam today are saying what they are saying and doing what they are doing? Their authority, they believe, is that of Holy Writ, a divine authority modeled by the greatest and clearest paradigm for mankind, for all peoples, all places, and for all times, in meaning today as well, including Iraq and Syria. So, let's now look at ISIS. What did ISIS do? They were from Syria. They were confronting Assad. They should be our allies. Isn't that ironic? We don't like Assad either. Assad, who is Assad? He is a minority Muslim from the Alevi tribe. He and his father have been the only ones who have protected the Christians in Syria, who have been there for 2,000 years. Yet your government and my government would like to see him eradicated. So we have been supporting the rebels, the Al-Nusra Fund and ISIS. Fortunately, we haven't given them any weapons. There seemed to be a reticence to give them respites for one very good reason. We didn't know what they would do with those weapons. Well, for six weeks ago, they went right across the border of Syria, and they moved into Iraq, and they took over Mosul. They took over Tikrit. They took over Samarra. They took over, they took over Al-Ramadi. I'm sorry, from Hadith Adam. They took over also Tal Afar. These are the big cities on the Tigris River. And then they went up the Euphrates river and took all the cities along the Euphrates, Gaim and Anna, Ramadi. I'm sorry, not Ramadi. Uh, yes, it is Ramadi. It's Fallujah that they haven't got yet. Now, it's fascinating. They followed the two rivers, taking all the major cities on the two rivers, including the Mosul Dam. These are not men necessarily from Iraq, except one. We'll get to him. Mosul was not a, is not a, Muslim city. It's a Christian city. It's been a Christian city for 2,000 years. It's one of the oldest Christian cities in that part of the world. Same with Tikrit is where Saddam Hussein came from. And what is the first thing they did? Well, they went and they went to those men who had thrown up their weapons. Remember, as soon as they went in with this blitzkrieg, all these Shiite soldiers, these Shiite soldiers who did were not well trained. Remember, their officers were all given their jobs by al-Maliki. Al-Maliki was the one who was made prime minister by Ashistani. Ashistani won the elections, which we were the ones that actually created the elections, the democratic elections, uh, the largest number of people who are going to win the vote. And who were the majority in Iraq? They were the Shiites. The Shiites won the vote. Maliki immediately got rid of all the Sunnis, got rid of all the Sunni officers, and replaced them with Shiite officers who had no training. Of course they could not stand up against ISIS. They took off their uniforms, threw down their weapons. And then Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, is his name. Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi is the leader of ISIS. He then came with his men. They went into those bases where these men had taken off their uniforms. They went into the offices of every one of these bases. They went to the filing cabinets, pulled out, and looked at the addresses for every one of these men. And they went to every one of these addresses and arrested every one of them in civilian clothes. There you can see them being arrested, bringing in. Can we turn these lights off so you can actually see that? Because I can't hardly see that. Take these lights off me. There you can see they're being beaten as they're being arrested. And then they took them out into the desert and they gave them spades to dig trenches. And they stood along the trenches and they mowed them down with AK 47s. 1,700 in one afternoon. And they filmed everything they did. Now, why did they film it? For you? No. For the world? No for Muslims to see. They wanted Muslims to see what they were doing. Why do you think they wanted Muslims to see what they're doing? Because that's exactly what Muhammad did in 627 with the Jews in Medina. Gave them spades, dug their own trenches, stood them along the trenches, slit their throats. Now in the 21st century, they use AK-47s. Then they went back, and you can see here, they've been mowed down. There they are along the trenches, all the bodies, and they're still shooting them alive. There's the, their flag. That's their ISIS flag. It has the Shahada on a black flag. They went to Mosul, 
And they went to all the banks and took all the money from the banks, two billion dollars worth for their war treasure. That's exactly what Muhammad did. He went to every one of the, whenever he had a raid, he took all the monies from those he had conquered and gave it to his men, kept, kept one-fifth for himself, 20% for himself. Now, al-Baghdadi has not kept one-fifth for himself. He's been very clear to say he's not the prophet himself. And then they went to the cathedrals, to the monasteries outside. This monastery here is one of the oldest. It's from the 4th century. They took down the cross and put up the ISIS flag. There you can see the ISIS flag on it. They went inside, threw out all the priests. They could only leave with the clothes on their back. Destroyed the relics and most importantly destroyed the manuscripts. That happened just three weeks ago. These are the oldest Chaldean Bibles in the world. And they destroyed them. These Bibles date back to as early as the 4th century. That's 300 years before Islam even began. They've all been destroyed. How many people have been up in arms about it? Has your government? Have any of you been complaining about it? These are our, this is our history. These are our scriptures from the 4th century. Just destroyed three weeks ago. And then they went to Mosul and they put this sign on all the houses of the Christians. This is the Dimi sign. That's the letter Nun, which is one of the letters of the Arabic alphabet. It stands for Nazaria. In Quran, the name for Christians is Nazaria. We are Christian. We are Nazarene, or Nazarun, to be plural. It's the Nazarun who are the Christians in the Quran. That's the Christian sign. He put that on every Christian house. There's a pictures of it right there. And he gave them three options. Convert, pay the jizya tax, which is a jizya tax which is only ordained for Christians and Jews. That's from Surah 9, Ayah 29. And the jizya tax is to pay, be paid by Christians and Jews. If you're a poor family, you pay 20%. If you're a medium income family, you pay 20, 40%. If you're a rich family, you pay 8, 80%. A Muslim pays the zakat, which is only 2.5%. Can you see what you would rather pay? The zakat or the jizya? Now, interestingly, when he went to, the, uh, to Sinjar, where the Yazidis are, the Yazidis are not Christians or Jews. Notice what he demanded of them. He, they gave them only two options, convert or die. He did not at all impose the jizya on them, because the jizya is unique only to Christians and Jews. This man knew from where he was speaking. This just happened three weeks ago. There are now no Christians in Mosul, because they took a fourth option. They all fled. A town that has been a Christian town for 2,000 years. The only Christians that are left are the poor and the infirm. The old and the infirm, excuse me. The old and the infirm. All the children have left. I won't go into other pictures. We had other pictures I didn't want to show. One of the things they did in Aleppo and Syria is they crucified Christian men. And they took children and they beheaded them. There's a terrible picture on YouTube right now where you can look and see where a, man, a father is holding up his two-year-old daughter with her beautiful dress on, and she's missing her head. Her head's on the floor. Why did they do that? Surah 47, Ayah 4, straight out of Scripture. Not for our consumption. This is for Muslims to learn and to hear. And this is the man that's leading them. Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. That's his earlier picture. That is his newest picture. Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi is from Samarra in Iraq. Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi has a Ph.D., in Islamic studies from the Islamic University of Baghdad. This man knows his material. That's why he quotes directly from the Quran. He quotes exactly from Muhammad's own life. He follows what the Prophet did and he follows what the Scripture says. That's why he's filming everything he does. And that's why his group has grown from 800 to 10,000. Can you see why he's so attractive? He's not asking the world to like him. He doesn't care dilly spot about your own opinion. He's not there to terrorize you. He's there to show Muslims this is the true Islam. This is rooted Islam. This is what the Prophet did. But your government hasn't even said this yet. I don't even think they're even aware of what I'm saying. Because they've not read the Quran. They've not gone back to his traditions. They've not gone back to Ibn Hisham or al Baqidi. They've not gone back to Ibn, Ibn Isaac. They've not gone back to his sayings. Written and first compiled by men like Al-Buhari, Sahib Muslim, Ibn Dawud, Tirmidhi. He's not even gone back to any of the exegetes to understand the Quran. Men like Al-Tabri, 
By Dawid, Zamakshari, Suyuti, these are the men you have to read, these are the ones you have to go to, these are the ones I've been working with for three, for 30 years I've been working with these men, reading their material to understand why it is it that motivates these radicals. And what motivates these radicals is the book and the man. What the prophet did, what the prophet said, all based on scripture. Can you see why he's so powerful and why he's so attractive? Not to look at, but what he does. He took off his military dress, then put on a clerical dress. And this is from Mosul. This has just happened three weeks ago. He then gave a sermon at the largest mosque in Mosul, stamping his authority and saying, I am the new caliph. Took off the last two letters of ISIS, and now it's only called Islamic State. Not of, ISIS, not of Iraq and al-Shams. He's saying, I am the Islamic State of the world. And that's why you're seeing men from all over the world and women now join him. 450 that we know of right now. A few weeks ago, one of our American reporters was beheaded, Jim Foley. The man that beheaded him was an English Muslim. We know him. He's part of the Mahajurun party, the group that I work against, the ones that I have to confront. He was from a Jamaican background, converted to Islam. He spoke in a London accent before he then slit his throat. He did it again last week to Steve, I forget his last name, Solfat, Solkar, or something like that, a Jewish American from Miami. And as he talked, I don't know, if, please don't look at the video, but look and hear what the man's saying. He's no longer being peaceful. He's belligerent, laughing at Obama, belittling him with his London accent. We've had 450 of these young men now join this group. Most of them will never come home. They will die fighting for their God. We've got to wake up to this, folks, because this is not just a small group. There's 80 million of them in the Tabigli Jamaat alone. The Tabigli Jamaat is even more radical than this group. Now, who must confront them? Well, most people I ask this question to, they say, well, that's the state's responsibility. In some ways, yes, it is. And thank goodness, your government has finally woken up to the fact that we've got to defend the Yazidis. And finally, in Sinjar, they sent their jets and they sent their drones and they were able to, just, to stop the, the ISIS from taking over and destroying those 40,000 Yazidis that were on that mountaintop. They have now been saved because of your jets. And I thank you Americans, because you're, Ameri you're the only military that can do that. You're the only military anywhere in the world that has 10 aircraft carrier groups. Did you know that? And with every one of those aircraft carriers, there's 26 ships that go along with them. I thank God, as I'm a pacifist, I'm unique here, I'm a Mennonite. We separate church and state. When God, Jesus said, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and to God what belongs to God. The responsibility to the church is not to go to war, but it is the state's responsibility. And that's why we do, and we're told to support the state. In Romans 13, Paul says we're to support the state. And the state does have a responsibility to protect, and your country protects more than any other country in the world. That's why you have a $600 billion defense budget. Show me any other country that even has a $100 billion defense budget. You have six times more than any other country on earth. You have had a great responsibility, and that's why we keep the shipping lines open around the world. It's because of your country. You're not thanked for it. Let me thank you as a European for what you're doing. And it's your jets right now from the George Bush aircraft carrier there in the Persian Gulf that's actually protecting the Peshmerga, the Kurds, rebels. Those Kurdish rebels were about ready to give up. They already left the Sinjar province because they could no longer keep stand against ISIS. They had already given up Mosul Dam. That dam controls the water for all of Iraq and could have flooded Baghdad if it was broken, destroyed. And your military went and helped the Peshmerga to take back that dam two weeks ago. And right now, ISIS has been stopped because of your jets and your drones. And I thank you for that. The problem is, your jets and your drones can do a pretty good job as long as they're in the desert, and as long as they have trade lines, as long as they're reinforcing along roads. There are very few roads in Iraq, and they're easy. They're sitting ducks. They're targets, easy from the air. But remember, they've taken Mosul, Tikrit, Samara. They're about ready to take Baghdad. You cannot destroy enemies within cities. That takes boots on the ground. Your government will not put boots on the ground. ISIS knows that, and that's why they're taking and they're uh, spending their dues. But here's the real problem. The Hug Baghdadis of the world, they are a 
group that is actually following an ideology. Can your state confront that ideology? When that ideology is based on a book modeled by a man. The book is the Quran. The man is Muhammad. Can your government take on Muhammad in the Quran? You remember when those two Qurans were supposedly flushed down in Guantanamo Bay, the riots that happened all over the Muslim world because of that? No, you cannot. You dare not take on the Quran. Remember that pastor in Florida when he burned a Quran and the furore that happened all over the world just by burning one Quran. That Sunday, I went to Speaker's Corner, got up on the ladder, held up this Quran right here, and I said, Will someone give me a cigarette lighter? And so someone handed it to me, and I put the flame underneath, and I'm going to burn it right now, I said to all those there at Speaker's Corner. They just start screaming and yelling. So I said to them, how many of you would kill me if I burn this Quran right here? They all yelled, we will kill you. I said, will all of you kill me? Yes, we'll all kill you. Is there anybody here who will not kill me? Not one hand went up. That was in London, right after that preacher did that. Now, fortunately, I did not burn the Quran there at Speaker's Corner. That's why I'm alive today. <laughs> and I held this book up here, and I said, listen, I can burn this Bible right now. We won't do anything to you. You can destroy all the Bibles in the world, and we still have the Word of God. It's not the pages that matter. It's the words on the pages that matter. We don't kill anybody. It seems like our book can stand up to anything. You just burn one Quran, and you'll kill anybody that destroys your Quran. What's wrong and so weak about your Quran? Can the state do that? No. The state cannot confront them because the state is, cannot deal with religious ideology. Look at the Danish cartoons. The Quran, the flush down in Guantanamo Bay. Because of the separation of church and state, the state does not understand the church. It never will understand religion. Most of our officials aren't even religious. Don't expect them to fight this battle. This is not their battle. They want unanimity. They want inclusivity. They want all religions to say the same thing. They want all religions to be peaceful. That's why Tony Blair has to say what he said. Of course he believes the Quran is a book of peace. He has to believe that. He wants the world to believe that. He wants everybody to believe that all religions are religions of peace. Don't expect them to fight this battle for us. So who can confront radical Muslims? Well, who else starts from the same ideology? Do we not also start from a book called the Bible, modeled by a man? And who is that man? Moses? No. Joshua? No. Billy Graham? No. Jack? I almost caught you on that one. I saw a few people say, yeah, yeah, oh no. Jesus. We've just been singing about him, haven't we, tonight? It's Jesus that we follow, and it's his gospel that we follow. That's why we are the only people that understand this group. We are the only ones that start from the same paradigm. We also start with a book modeled by a man. But what a better book, and what a better man. I always keep these two books with me. These are the two I use at Speaker's Corner everywhere I go. Can you see which is smaller and which is bigger? There's a reason for that. I want you all to know this is the bigger, the better book. And this is the book I always use, and it destroys this book. We're going to show you that tomorrow. We're going to show you how much better this book is, how much bigger this God is, how much greater this Jesus is. In every category, we win, which means we're the only ones that can do this. We're the only ones that can take on the Baghdadis of the world. We're the only ones that can take the radicals of the world because we are so all radical, as much as that makes you feel uncomfortable, but radical means root, and we go back to the root, and we always go back to the book. Now, here I'm going to put Jack on the hot seat. Does Jack open the Bible on Sunday mornings? Yes. Oof, you pass that test. Does he read from it? Yes. Does he exegete it? Yes. And apply it to your lives? Yes. Good man. You made it. We demand that of our pastors. Which means that Jack is just as radical as al-Baghdadi is. <laughs> now see him squirm. But that's exactly what we need today. We need radical Christians who go back to our book, who go back to our man, because we by far have got the better book, and we by far have got the better man. Because if you really want peace today, who are you going to have to come back to? He's the only man that speaks of peace. Don't go back to Muhammad. Go back to Jesus. And what does Jesus say about the sword? Put away the sword. For he who lives by the sword dies by the sword. Matthew 26, verse 52. Thank God for Jesus. He never even let the disciples defend him. 
The one time that he needed a defense, when he was there in the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter took out a sword, cut off the ear of the servant. Jesus put that ear back on the servant, and he told Peter to put away his sword. He wouldn't even let his disciples defend him. That's my Jesus. Ooh, I love Jesus. And that's why he's so good to come back to. And what we're going to do tomorrow is we're going to look and show you just how easy this is and how easy it is for you to use this material. Because you've got to start learning this material. But in order to learn it, you need to know what the weaknesses are on the enemy. Yeah, I'm going to show you just how weak they are in every area and how you can supply in every context, how you can go and take them on and then supply the gospel as an antidote. Because the gospel in every one of these areas, I'm not going to do it tonight, we'll wait for tomorrow night on that. But here's the problem. We have no models. Everything I'm going to talk about tomorrow night, our missiological model does not deal with confrontation. We only want church planting. That's only the, mo the only model we're permitted to use. We only have what we call ironic models, how to make friends with Muslims. And every, every um, uh, what, what am I looking for? Every um, training course that you go to is all on how to make friends. Am I correct? How to come alongside Muslims. How to make friends with them. How to find bridges with them. What happens when you want to start preaching the gospel? Because sooner or later, in that missiological model, you're going to have to talk about Jesus, are you not? And you're going to have to say that he is God. Please do. Because somewhere you're going to have to say that he is God. He's more than a prophet. And you're going to have to say that he died on the cross. What's going to happen then? How are you going to defend yourself then? Because that is confrontational, as confrontational as you can get. That's as offensive as you can get for a Muslim, to say that Jesus is God and that he died on the cross. And yet that's exactly the gospel right there. And I refuse to get into a conversation with a Muslim unless those two are not brought up at some point. I have wasted my time if I haven't talked about Jesus as God and the fact that he died on the cross. I've got to say it. Because that man's going to hell or that woman's going to hell unless he hears that. It's not the right Jesus that they have. We'll talk about more of that tomorrow. We don't have any models to confront Muslims with that. There's no room for confrontation, no room for conflicts between Islam and Christian globally. Most, of the Muslim, most missionaries I meet, they spend all their time trying to find out how they can make, have peace with Islam. I get that every church I go. Jay, how could we have peace with Islam? And I have to scratch my head on that. If you want peace, you better be prepared for war. You better be prepared for war. Islam is not a peaceful religion. And Islam doesn't even understand what peace is about. I don't recall Jesus ever saying that. What did Jesus say in Matthew 10? I have not come to bring peace. I have come to bring the sword. I have come to set father against son and mother against daughter. And look what he says to the disciples in the same chapter. The great commissioning of the 12 disciples. You are going to be sent out as lamb before wolf. You're going to be hated for what you believe. You're going to be persecuted for what you believe. You're going to be imprisoned for what you believe. You're going to be flogged for what you believe. You're going to be killed for what you believe. Those are the five things that Jesus promises all the disciples there in Matthew 10 in his commissioning. Now, Jack, were you commissioned like that? No. I'm not commissioned like that. And yet that's exactly commissioning that he gave to the disciples. Every one of them was hated. They were all persecuted. Every one of them was put in jail. They were all flung, and every one of them was killed except for John. They received their commissioning. And I want the same commissioning. Because if we're not speaking the gospel, if we're not talking about Jesus as God, then we're not preaching the gospel. No wonder we're not being persecuted. No wonder we're not getting flogged. How many of us have been put in jail? And how many of us have died for what we believe? We've got to get back to that model. Because that's the model Jesus gave us. We have no school. Secondly, there's no school in the world that's teaching you what I've just said tonight. There's not one school anywhere that's doing that. We're the only ones who are doing it now in London with the Fander Institute. And now we're being asked, suddenly we're getting calls from all over the world to go to Norway, to come to Belarus. We're going to be having to go to, uh, we're going to Finland. We're not, they've asked us to come to Germany and to Switzerland. Now they want us to go to Italy. We're getting calls everywhere to come and teach this new material. Because everybody's found, suddenly found flat-footed. They don't know what to do with radical Islam. We don't have any school in Britain. There's no school here in the United States. Biola University is one of the closest that comes to it. Talbot Seminary. They are now starting to teach Islamic apolo apologetics for the first time. God bless them for finally including it in the curriculum. And the man that's teaching it is a good friend of mine. and He's teaching most of my material. 
in Australia, at the Melbourne School of Theology, is the first school that actually is willing to teach Islamic polemics. But that's the only school in the world that's willing to do that. Therefore, we have no confrontation theology. It just doesn't exist. Yet when I look at the early church, and when I look at the book of Acts, when I look at chapter 15 to 17 of Acts, just read those three chapters, and you can't come away without confrontation. If you want someone who is confrontation, look at Jesus in the temple, overturning the tables. Look at Jesus in Matthew 23, from verse 13 to 33. You hypocrites, you den of vipers, you white sepulcher, the whole chapter is full of confrontation. But the man that really is a man of confrontation is Paul. What a man for today. Saul, who became Paul. Saul, who was a Jew, but not just any Jew. He was a Pharisee, but not just any Pharisee. He was a Pharisee from the Shammai school, a Pharisee who believed in eradicating the authorities that had them controlled and contained. And that's why he was there at the foot of the, a foot of the, of the I'm sorry, there with, when Stephen was being stoned, holding the clothes of those who stoned Stephen and was on his way to Damascus to bring back the ch Christians in chains and to kill them if need be. And he did kill Christians. And God met him in a dynamic way there on the road to Damascus and made him from Saul into Paul. And I love to look and see who Paul became. Saul and Paul were very similar. They were both very educated. Saul and Paul. Saul, when he was an educated man, was still educated as Paul. And that's why he could go into the Rapagus and he could argue with the Epicureans and the Stoics. And that's why he could take on, there at Mars Hill, he could take on anybody. And when you look at chapter 15 to 17, look and see what he did at Laodicea. I'm sorry, Laodicea. And look what he said at, uh, look what he did in Ephesus. Almost every city he went into, what did he do? He went right into the synagogues and he confronted the Jews with what they had done to the Messiah. They did not like him. Sometimes they threw him out of the synagogue. There in Ephesus in chapter 19, he took the shoes from his feet, dusted off the shoes, and then he went out into the lecture hall of Tyrannus. And it says for two years, he spoke day and night so that everybody heard the gospel. What is the lecture hall of Tyrannus? It is a debating chamber. You can see it in Ephesus today. That's my Paul. Oh, he got thrown into prison. He was whipped. Twice he was almost stoned to death. He caused a riot there in Ephesus. Cappadocia, Berea, Laodicea. Sorry, what are the other names I'm thinking of right off the top of my head? These are the places that everywhere that Paul went, he caused confrontation. We don't do that today. We don't teach people to do that today. We're scared of confrontation. We want peace with Islam. You can't have peace with Islam. Because Islam is very similar to what Paul was up against in the first century. Take a look at a radical Muslim and look at Saul. Saul was a man who knew scripture. The radical Muslim knows scripture. Saul wanted a theocratic state. The radical Muslims want theocratic state. It's called a caliphate. Saul was willing to use the sword if need be. The Muslims, radical Muslims, are more than willing to use the sword. Saul quoted scripture in everything he did. The radical Muslims quote scripture. The only difference between Saul and Paul that I can see is that once he became Paul, he never used a sword again. He didn't need to. This became his sword. What a better sword this is. And we can destroy the Quran with this book. We'll show you that tomorrow. Folks, let me just finish this off so we can see where we're going to go. We'll show this. To, oops, I just ran out of place. We'll finish it off there because I can see that my PowerPoint is not quite finished. What I want to just impose on you or really leave you with, we do have a formidable foe against us right now. Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi is probably the best example of real Islam that we've seen in our lifetime. Much more so than Umar Osama bin Laden, who is nothing more than a playboy. Ayman Zubahidi, who only knew what his teachers had told him. Abu Baghdadi has a doctorate in Islamic theology and Islamic history. That's why he knows from what he speaks. That's why he's such an attraction for Muslims all over the world. Now, we may be able to contain him, hopefully, just within Iraq and Syria, and hopefully he will get no further. I hope so, using our military. But we cannot destroy that which he speaks about, the ideology that is growing and growing and growing all over the world, that's taken the identity of so many of these young men and women. That ideology is based on a text modeled by a man. The only way you can take and eradicate that ideology is with a better ideology. And we've got the better ideology. You'll see this tomorrow. We are the only ones that can understand the Baghdadis of the world because we're just like them. We also want to know who God is. We also want to see what he has for us today. We also believe in the word of God. We believe in a heaven and a hell. We have everything they have, but much better.
because we've got the real truth and we've got the real man. Now, tonight's been rather disturbing with all the pictures and all the scenario I'm giving you. It sounds very depressing. Tomorrow, we're going to give you a better report. Tomorrow, we're going to show you exactly what we've got to throw at Islam. In about three weeks, I'm doing a debate in Toronto with Shabir Ali. Dr. Shabir Ali is considered to be the world's best Muslim debater. I've debated him five times. But tomorrow, on, in three weeks, I'm going to introduce some new material on the Quran that's never been heard before. And this is going to destroy the Quran historically. I don't know what he's going to do with it. I don't know how he's going to respond to it. Pray for this debate coming up. It's in three weeks. But I'm going to introduce some of that material tomorrow. I'm going to show you just how good the Bible is when it's compared to the Quran. I'm going to show you how good Yahweh is compared to Allah. I'm going to show you how great Yeshua is compared to Issa. And I'm going to show you how great Christianity is compared to Islam. We're on the winning side. We've got all the reason to be hopeful. But we've got to get into this battle. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, as we see the news around us, as we've been seeing how ISIS is growing so fast and moving not only so quickly, but they're doing so using scripture and a model that is inspiring Muslims all over the world, from 800 to 10,000 in just six weeks. Lord, we have never really come across this kind of paradigm before in our lifetime, and we need to know what to do with about it. And really, Lord, we are the only ones who can do something about it. So, Lord, we ask us tomorrow as we come and look at the solution, as we look and see just how great you are and what you can give us and what we can use and how we can go, we ask, Lord, that you'll give us not only that ability to use it, but the courage to go in public and do for you what you have already done for us. We give this evening to you and everything that is going to transpire, not only today, but tomorrow. Put it into your hands. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now, before you start the music... Why don't we all stand together? Before you start the music, though, I did say I would have some questions. Is that okay? Sure. If any of you do have questions, let's before you stand up, are there any questions that are really pressing that I could try to answer? I get threatened all the time. I get really threatened all the time. Every Sunday. We've got a great God. Don't worry about me. I'm well protected. Yeah. Uh, you bypassed the Crusades. Okay, let's do with the Crusades. Um, I want you to be a Muslim right now. Your name is Abdul, okay? Abdul, you don't like the Crusades. Why don't you like the Crusades? You're Abdul right now. Put on a Muslim cap. Just say, look, be a good, obedient Muslim. That's what Islam means. You're obedient. So right now, tell me, why is it you don't like the Crusades? I don't care. Why is it you don't like the Crusades? Tell me. Because the Christians are made to look bad. No, no. As a Muslim now, you're not a Christian. You're a Muslim. <laughs> because the Christians attack them. That's right. And they use that trying to defend their own God. So you don't like the idea that we should use weapons to defend our God, right? Sure. Well, let me shake your hand on that. We can't. Let's just pretend we're shaking hands right now. So that's one thing we can agree upon. Now let me ask you very quickly. Since you don't like the Crusades, you say it's not good for somebody to use a sword to defend their own God. Let me ask what your prophet did in Medina between 622 and 624 and 625 and 627 against the Jews. Did he not use a sword to defend his God? Are you, do you want to condemn that too? No, he's a prophet. Now wait a minute. You just start condemning us. You're being inconsistent then. So before you can even condemn us, you better condemn yourself. You want to sit down. But let me tell you, as a Christian, I would ask the same question. As a Christian, I'm the only one that can ask this question. You have no right to ask it because you're not willing to be consistent with your own theology and your own prophet. So don't even ask that question. Let me ask it. What about the Crusades? Now, if you look at your history, right, you will see the Crusades, was that, was that actually formed by, formed by the church? King Richard. Was he head of the church? But he had a flag with a cross on it. Did he have a right to do that? What does Christ say? When he was asked about the coin there, and he asked whether or not he's to pay taxes. Look at the man on the coin. Caesar's. Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Give to God what belongs to God. He was separating church and state at that time. Christ did that for a very good reason. The church never goes to war. And when the state takes the name of the church and goes to war, I can condemn it. Because I'm going back to Jesus Christ. And I'm going to ask, what would Jesus Christ say about the Crusades? And he would have condemned the Crusades. Therefore, I condemn the Crusades. But you have no right to condemn the Crusades. See, if you really want peace, you better come back to Jesus Christ. But thanks for the question. God bless you. Come on home. Yeah, any other question? At the back, yeah, in the green shirt. 
Okay, ISIS in the Muslim context. Is, you mean define it? Ah, come tomorrow. Okay, I'll give you a quick caveat. Let me ask you, you're going to be now, Ahmed, you're my second Muslim. Okay, Ahmed, let me ask you, as a Muslim, is Issa an Arabic word? Exactly. Ask any Muslim scholar if Issa is an Arabic word. It is not. It has no Arabic meaning. It means nothing. It's not Isao. That's Isao. Isao, the brother of Jacob. That's not Issa. So where does Issa come from? You have no idea. Let me help you. It comes from your Quran. It is introduced by your Quran. So who in the world is Issa? Because the name for Jesus in Arabic is Yeshua and has been for 2,000 years, like Yeshua in Hebrew. So why, whoever put the Quran together, why did they not use the Arabic word? When you're the ones that tell me that the Quran is written in perfect Arabic because that's God's holy language. Then why in the world did they not know Jesus' Arabic name? Ooh, I love this. In order to answer that question, since you don't have the answer, you may want to know and look at the 93 places in the Quran where Issa is found. And he's found 93 times in the Quran. How many times is Muhammad found in the Quran? Four times. So who do you think is the more important? <laughs> Nonetheless, let's get beyond. Let's get back to Issa again. 93 times. Look at every one of those stories. Surah 3, Ayah 46, which says that Issa in the cradle was speaking from the cradle. I don't remember Jesus speaking from the cradle. Three verses later in 49... Verse 49, it says that he took some clay, made it in the form of birds, blew on them, and they flew up into the air. Did Jesus do that in our Bible as a baby? I don't remember that. So where do these stories come from? They don't come from our Bible. Take a look and see where these stories come from. They come from the lost books of the, of, of, uh, the infancy of Jesus Christ. They lost Arabic books of the infancy of Jesus Christ. These are Syriac writings written in the Nagamati Gospels, written by Gnostics. These are Gnostic writings, all of them borrowed, written in the second century, slapped into the Quran in the seventh century. If you take a look at the name for Jesus in, in Syriac, it is Iesu. When you take the story and you put it into your Quran, you take the name as well. Iesu becomes Issa in the Quran. Ooh, tu, 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 tu. You've got the wrong Jesus. You've got a Gnostic Jesus. That Jesus does not get on the cross in Surah 4, 1, Ayah 57. That Jesus refuses to die. And because he does not get on the cross and die, I'm damned. Therefore, I refuse to go back to Issa. Come on home. Come back to Jesus. Hope that helps. Okay, now we're going to have some music. All right, I had a song picked. Now I've got to rethink. Now let's go ahead and stand. <laughs> 